back again. Page 24. The McMolding Base. This article of laboratory furniture, shown by figure 11, demands special attention to its construction, otherwise it will prove a constant annoyance. As no ordinary wooden box will remain tight enough to prevent the molding sand from fall, falling through its seams upon the floor. That's The diagram shows the general design, one of which has been found practical and convenient. It is four feet long, 26 inches wide, and 36 inches high. It is lined with sheet zinc, which does not rust by contact with the moist sand, effectually prevents the escape of the ladder. It is provided with a shelf, A, upon which each completed mold may be placed, while others are being prepared or until ready for the casting. It has two drawers, B, 18 inches wide by 14 inches deep, in which may be kept either plaster or smaller molding glass rings or other accessories of molding operation. It is provided with a lid and should be kept closed when not in use, so as to exclude all foreign substances which might seriously interfere with casting. Accessories of the molding box consist of various sizes of the Bailey molding flask, which with the method of using them will be described under the head of dyes and counter dyes. One Hawes flask, see page 313, and two three sections of galvanized iron stove piping each having the dimensions of about six inches in length and four and a half inches in diameter. The simple form of flask is very desirable for many molding operations for the dental laboratory. Its value consisting in the fact that it will accommodate all sizes of molds and that it is less liable on account of greater quantity of molding sand required by it to the bubbler which often occurs when melted zinc is poured in contact with the scant and tightly packed sand in the Bailey flask. It is essential that all molding operations should be performed upon perfectly level surfaces for the purpose two or three molding blocks of seasoned pine, eight inches square and two and a half, two inches thick will be found convenient aids in order to avoid lumpiness of to secure uniformity of condition in the sand when moistened, moistening it preparatory to molding. A sieve, sieve of not less than 12 inches in diameter with meshes of minimum size of 1 16th of an inch will be found of value. The sieve, sieve should be formed of brass or copper wire as an ordinary iron wire sieve, sieve will soon become useless from oxidation, which is greatly assisted by contact with the wet molding sand. A painter's brush, one and a half inches in diameter by two inches in length, will be find you, found useful and convenient for the purpose of removing adherent particles of molding sand from the surface and interstices of plaster mold bottle each time it is drawn from the sand matrix. Anvil and swaging block. As the laboratory is often situated on the upper floor, the use of the hammers in swaging plates may be the cause of much annoyance from noise and vibration. This, however, can be entirely avoided by in interposing rubber between the block and the floor upon which it rests. Figure 12a shows the block of pine or poplar wood, seven and a half inches square by three, 23 and a half inches high. B and C represent a sheet of rubber eight and a half inches square by one and a half inches thick, securely fastened to the lower of the block by screws. 
This block fits into a box made of one and a half inch pine boards broader below than above. Figure 13D. Furnished with the pieces of solid rubber cylinder, figure 12E, one and a half inches in diameter and by two inches long, let into it by holes of the same dimensions, bored to the depth of one and a half inches. The thickness of rubber are thus interposed between the block upon which the anvil rests and the floor of the laboratory. And so much of the sound due to the percussive force of the hammer is thereby deadened and scarcely any noise or vibration will be observed by persons in other parts of the house. The anvil, figure 14, which should weigh not less than 40 pounds, may be securely fastened to the block upon which it rests by strong iron staples, and the box or outside covering of the block reinforced by iron hands, as shown in H. A swaging block so constructed may be looked upon as a permanent piece of laboratory furniture, and one that will not be likely to get out of order. Two swaging hammers are required. One weighing about two pounds is a is of much use in starting the plate. The heavier one, which should weigh five and a half or six pounds, is used with greater force after the plate has been made to partially conform to the zinc die when there is no longer danger of its pleating or folding. Plaster table and sink, figure 15. Well, let's look at figure 14 first. Although Plaster, table, and sink. The working of plaster, which forms so important a part of the operations of the dental laboratory, is entitled to much more care and attention than it usually receives at the hands of the mechanical dentist. It may be employed with neatness and precision when its results become truly artistic, or as too often the case, it may be handled in so slovenly and untidy manner as to greatly lower the standard of results, and unless kept carefully within the precincts assigned it, cause the laboratory to become a most unattractive place. It is of importance, therefore, that a suitable table be provided upon which the casting and subsequent trimming of plaster models and other parts of the laboratory work depending upon the employment of plaster may be performed. The plaster table should be supplied with the sink and receptacle for the cuttings and refuse fragments. The accompanying diagram shows such a table and sink which author has found to be practical and convenient. It has been designed especially to protect the floor and other parts of the laboratory from contact with the with plaster. It is 31 inches high, 23 inches wide, and 27 inches long, and it has an opening, A, 8 inches by 8 inches square, under which rests a portable box, C, 12 by 12 inches square, intended to receive all cuttings and refuse plaster. The table is provided with small rest for convenience in resting the model while trimming the proper dimensions. It is also provided with a drawer for the reception of plaster knives, spatulas, and camel's hair brushes in mixing plaster and casting and trimming models. A more elaborate plaster table of recent design is shown in figure 10. It is one of three benches designed for vulcanite and gold plaster work, respectively. 
intended to be placed side by side to complete the furnishings of the laboratory. The accessories of the plaster table, named in the order in which they are used, consist first of two short broad-necked bottles for Sandre and shellac varnish, two or more flexible rubber plaster bowls, the same number of bone ivory and spatulas for mixing one or more plaster knives, such as are sold in the dental depots of, for the purpose of reducing the size of plaster models or, bed, or a bench knife as shown in figure 16 and 17. It will be found very effective in cutting down hard plaster and preparing the model for plasking in rubber and solenoid work and a number of different sizes of camel hair brushes and are, which are indispensable in carrying the plaster into the deeper parts when running the casting impressions for partial dentures and indeed all impressions having deep and more or less inaccessible points which might not be perfectly reached by the gravitation of the plaster unassisted by some such means as is suggested by the use of a camel's hair, pencils, or brushes. Two kinds of varnish are usually employed in the pr preparation of the surfaces of impressions for running out the models so as to prevent too close adhesion of one to the other. One is transparent and dries upon the plaster without color. The other is of the color of burnt sienna and imparts a dark yellow stain in the plaster. The first is made by dissolving found five ounces of gum sarder sanderac and a quart of alcohol. The latter is formed of gum shellac and alcohol in the same proportions. Gum sandarac dissolves rather slowly and requires a good quality of alcohol free from a very considerable percentage of water. <coughs> Otherwise, it will have a milky appearance and will not afford a perfectly glazed surface when applied to the plaster impression. These two varnishes are employed for totally different purposes. In running out an impression for objects should be to obtain a perfect service to the model, one that is free from air bells or roughness of any kind, as such imperfections will re be represented on, and we're going on to page 28, so I'm going to turn this on and upload. Uh, 